sense of gobbledygook here. Okay, so your speaker's off. Okay. Let's see, Cronin. You're muted, but you're muted now. Just You're on mute, Drew, unless you, in case you don't know that.
Oh, this is Carolyn. I'm just doing a sound check real quick. Testing one, two, three. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes.
Good morning. I'm Drew Ziegler, Chair of the Department of Political Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2021 Methodist University Research and Creativity Symposium. This is the 10th year for the symposium, and it has become a vital way to showcase student research here at Methodist University. The symposium is sponsored by the Center for Research and Creativity, which is one of the pathways of the MU journey. The MU journey consists of four enrichment pathways that all MU students can take advantage of throughout their career here. In addition to the Center for Research and Creativity, the other three pathways are the Laura S. Tiley Center for Leadership Development, the Center for Global Education, and the Center for Community Engagement. I'm delighted that you chose to participate in today's symposium, and I'm especially glad that you are with us in this session that focuses on political science topics. We are in the Allison Building, room 121 on campus, and you will hear three outstanding student presentations. And these will be Confidence in U.S. Government and Analysis of Survey Data by Carolyn Sierra, Taxing the Rich in Sweden, and Analysis of Public Opinion Data by Idona Seifa, and World's Inequality, Taxing the Top 1% by Mujahed Akbar. Each speaker will be sharing their screen with their PowerPoint slides. So it's probably best that you, sel that you select a side-by-side -side view once those slides appear on your screen. And as all of you have already done, please keep your, your mics muted throughout the presentations. Also, if you haven't already noted, the session is being recorded. Now, I hope all of you do have some questions about these presentations, and you should enter your questions into the chat at any time during, during the presentations. But we will wait till all three are finished before answering the questions. Well, okay, let's get started. Our first presenter is Carolyn Sierra, and her topic is Confidence in U.S. Government and Analysis of Survey Data. Thank you, Dr. Ziegler. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being us being here with us this morning. My name is Carolyn Sierra. I'm a political science major with a legal studies minor. After graduation, I plan to attend law school in the fall and hopefully one day become an attorney. My present today, as Dr. Ziegler already stated, will be based on my senior thesis that I completed last semester in Dr. Ziegler's senior seminar research class. It will be about confidence in the United States government and its analysis of survey data. On this slide, please find the contents of my presentation. I'll give everyone a moment to read over the contents. Um, so my research question for this presentation will, is what factors influence confidence in government confidence in government among the United States population. So I had several motivations for my research. Um, to begin, I believe that confidence in government is one of the best indicators of the health of a democracy. One of the main components of a democracy is rule by the people. Theoretically speaking, if the government is being ruled by the people, there should be a high level of confidence in government. A democracy cannot truly be successful and thriving if its citizens display a low level of confidence toward gov government. However, historically, since the American Revolution, American citizens have shown a large distrust of both government institution and politicians. In fact, the Constitution was based on the idea that the founding fathers wanted to limit the government and the nation's leaders to ensure that they, no, um, that they would never become as powerful as the monarchy that they had just um, escaped from. Specifically, the Republican Party has campaigned in favor of small government and the concept that less government is better. Many Americans, especially Republicans, have suspicions that the government will mis, uh, misuse their resources, aka their tax money. Finally, one of the main motivations for research is the recent spike in the idea of redistributive policies, such as welfare, such as welfare and universal health care. 
Redistributive policy is when the entire population of a country, specifically the middle and upper classes, are taxed, and this tax money is used to distribute the wealth back to the lower classes in the form of welfare, food stamps, or services such as healthcare. While completing my literature review on my research topic, I discovered, I discovered that there's a strong correlation between support for redistributive policies and confidence in government. In simple terms, simple terms, if citizens have confidence in government, they are more willing to give trust, um, to trust the government to properly redistrib um, redistribute resources, such as their tax money that I mentioned before, that they provide to them. Um, the methodology that was used in this research presentation is as follows. So the type of method, um, so the type of methodology is a quanti quantitative empirical study from secondary analysis. The statistical package used was PSPP, which is a public domain that is similar to SPSS. Um, the type of data that I used was individual survey research data, and the source of this data was the World Value Survey, which is free and accessible to everyone online. The World Value Survey conducts survey data in multiple countries around the world on a consistent basis. Um, the number of cases is 2,596, and this was collected from a period of 2017 to 2020. The statistical significance that we will use is P is less than 0.05%, which means that there is less than a five out of 100 chance that the data was collected out of error or just out of coincidence. And then the measure, measures of associate, association, which determine the strength of relationship that were used in this presentation are eta and gamma. And the presentation technique that I will be using um, throughout this process um, presentation is cross tabulation. Um, the dependent variable that I will be testing against multiple independent variables is depicted on the right as confidence in government. And then the four independent variables that I will be testing um, against confidence in government are sex, age, race, and political ideology. Um, so this is the model. Um, this is the cross tabulations table format that will be used throughout the remainder of this presentation. On the top, you will see the, ta um, the name of the table. Um, and then across the top, you will also find the category for the dependent variable, um, for the independent, sorry. Across the top, you will find the categories for the independent variables, these will change on every slide. And so on this first slide, you'll see that it's male and female. And then here on the side, you will find the categories for the dependent variables, which will remain the same throughout the entire presentation. Um, this is confidence in government. And so in my presentation, confidence in government is measured as quite a lot of confidence in government, not very much confidence in government or no confidence in government at all. And then at the bottom, you'll be able to see the P, um, the P value and the eta value and whether or not the hypothesis was supported. So to begin, my first hypothesis are men are more likely to have higher levels of confidence in government than women. Um, than women. I theorize this hypothesis due to the apparent gender inequality and gender discrimination against women in the history of the United States. I believe that since women have been a victim of discrimination in the past, many times condoned by the American government, that they would have lower levels of confidence in government than men. Um, how um, however, as you can see in this table and by my ADA value, this hypothesis was not supported. So you can see here that these percentages are pretty close together, which shows that there really is not a difference in the levels of confidence between men and women. My second hypothesis is that older Americans tend to have lower levels of confidence in government than younger Americans. My theory behind this hypothesis was that older Americans that were alive during the post-World War II and Great Depression era, um, therefore many older Americans right now have a large distrust, not just in government and the institutions in general. Um, think, how many of your grandparents still keep cash under their mattress or in a coffee can? Additionally, another additional theory that I used when coming up with this hypothesis was that many older Americans also tend to be conservative. Conservatives are typically less, have less confidence in government, as previously mentioned, prefer to keep their government small. However, as, dis 
As displayed in this chart, my hypothesis was not supported here. Um, in fact, my findings revealed that quite the opposite is true. Older Americans actually have more confidence in government than young Americans. Um, this is reinforced by the high gamma you can see here, which is 0.22, and the large gap in percentages that I highlighted here. Um, that I highlighted here, so you can see that 50 and older, it's 42 percent. Well, 18 through 29 is only 25, and 30 through 49 is only 28. Um, in hindsight, this does make sense because a lot of older Americans tend to rely heavily on government services. Such as such as Social Security and Medicare. Um, so it's hard not to have confidence in a government that is providing for you. My third hypothesis is that conservatives are less likely to have confidence in government than liberals. Here, leans left means liberal and leans right means conservatives. My theory behind this hypothesis is that just like in the, Repub the Republican Party platform states, the importance of small government and that less government is better. I assume that conservatives typically do not want big government because they are distrustful of government. However, again, I found the complete opposite to be true. In fact, I found a really strong relationship demonstrated by this gamma value. And so this gamma value is actually extremely high for most research, like most people do not get a gamma value this high. So this was a really interesting finding. Um, um, as you can see, 56% of conservatives versus 12% of liberals answered that they had quite a lot of trust in government. Since this finding was so strong and so odd based on my theory, I started to question why and how such findings were possible. The first thing that I looked at was the year of the survey. In 2000, which is right here, I highlighted up right here, a Republican president, President Trump was in office. This led me to think that maybe it was the person who was in the White House that was responsible for this disparity. Therefore, I decided to run the same test on survey data collected from 2010 to 2014 during Obama's administration. Interesting enough, I found the opposite results from the previous slide. During Obama's administration, liberals showed high levels of confidence in government than conservatives um, at a 42% rather than the 12% that was displayed in this slide. So it went from 12 to 42 and to, um, oh, actually it went from 42 in 2010, 2014 to then 12 in 2017. Um, another important observation here is that the gamma value from this, from the 2010 to 2014 survey data was much closer together. So you can see that um, 42 to 32 is not as much closer together than 12% and 56% that is seen in the previous slide. Um, this can also represent that some polarization occurred in the United States during Trump's presidency that caused this to occur. Um, and so you can see here that my hypothesis here was supported. And then my fourth hypothesis was that white Americans are more likely to have higher levels of confidence than African Americans and Hispanics. I theorized this hypothesis for the same reason, um, or kind of the same reasons that my first hypothesis about men and women, that um, due to the apparent racial inequalities and racial discrimination against minorities in the history of the United States, I believed um, that since these minorities had been a victim of discrimination, and many of the times this is um, systematic discrimination by the government, that they would have lower levels of confidence in government. Um, so clearly here, my hypothesis was supported, which is demonstrated by the ADA value and the difference up here at the top that I highlighted. So 40% of white Americans had quite a lot of trust in government, while only 17% of black Americans had quite a lot of trust in government, and 24% of Hispanic Americans had quite a lot of trust in government. So the summary of my finding is, um, just to reiterate, are, there is no difference between men and women on their level of confidence in government. Older Americans have greater confidence in government than younger Americans. When a Republican, pre when a Republican president is in office, conservatives have greater confidence in government than liberals, and vice versa. When a Democratic president is in office, liberals have a greater confidence in government than conservatives. Um, so further research regarding the third and fourth bullet points that I just pointed out about the Republican and Democratic presidents um, can be analyzed in future studies kind of going back um, further dates, like further back from Obama's administration, um, but they extended beyond the scope of my research. 
And then my last finding was that white Americans have a higher level of confidence in government than African Americans and Hispanics. Um, so the implications for my research are one, that politicians should focus on increasing the confidence in government among certain demographics. Since, de since these demographics, such as young Americans and ethnic minorities, are known to be more, have less confidence in government as displayed in my presentation, um, one of my tips to politicians and to campaigns would be to prioritize these demographics by providing more resources to them, kind of how they did with the older Americans that are on Social Security and Medi um, Medicare and the following. Um, so the second impl implication is that the increasing polarization in the United States may lead to lower levels of confidence in government. Um, this was exemplified during the slide regarding Trump's presidency versus Obama's presidency and the levels of confidence in government during those administrations. And then finally, in connection to my earlier slide for motivation of research, um, the support for redistributive policies and confident governments are positively correlated. As one increases, the, also, the other also increases. Therefore, especially in the Democratic, Democratic Party, um, who is the main promoter of redistributive policy in the United States, um, they should focus on increasing the United States population's overall confidence in government so such, pol such redistributive policies are able to come first. Fruition. All right, thank you so much for all of your attention during my presentation. If you have any questions, please make sure to um, write them down or shoot them in the chat um, and we will address them all at the end of all the presentations today. I'm eager to hear all your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sierra, uh, great job. I mean, Carolyn, sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick uh, 30 seconds to mention something to uh, the next speaker. Okay, quick little technical note there. Okay, our next uh, presenter is Idona Seifa on the topic of taxing the rich in Sweden and analysis of public opinion data. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edona Sefa. I am from Kosovo. I'm a political science major with a minor in business administration. Today, I'll be talking about my senior thesis, which I completed last semester under the supervision of Dr. Andrew Sigler, and it focused on public opinion on taxation of the rich in Sweden. Please take a moment to look at the content. I'll be talking more in depth today. Several questions might already come to your mind as you read through the title of my presentation. The first question would be, why tax the rich? From the topics that were suggested as we started our senior seminar class last semester, the views on whether taxation of the rich is an essential characteristic of democracy was more striking to me. Personally, I was more interested to learn how taxation helps to redistribute wealth and also how it affects different categories of population. The first assumption was that after looking at this topic is that if rich, rich people have more wealth, that they can easily contribute more to the wealth of their society than the ones who are poor. The second question you all might have would be why Sweden? Sweden is a country I love. I see myself live there in the future. I also have a lot of family there. Uh, and since I was very young, I was very familiar with the culture and the language because this was influenced to me by my cousins who were born and raised there. There are more reasons to my choice of this country. Sweden is a social democratic country um, and many of the decision making there is considered to be very progressive. Sweden is known for imposing high taxes in their population where middle class prevails, which means the society is very much equal. How the variables were determined, the, de the variables were determined based on social background, economics and their employment status, demographics and political views that adult population in Sweden identifies as. And the relevance of this, this topic, one important point that could be considered towards the relevance of this topic would be the elections that were going on in the United States while we were completing our senior thesis last semester. The presidential elections especially were very important because the Democrats were 
choosing to deliver their program uh, in a very progressive and socialist um, ideas. I thought it would be interesting to elaborate in this topic in a social democratic country like Sweden and look at the differences and different policies uh, and regulations when it comes to decision making. Research question is, what factors influence public opinion and taxation of the rich among the adult population in Sweden? The methodology used for this study follows. This is a quantitative study which uses empirical secondary data. The statistical program which was used is PSPP, which functions similarly to SPSS. The source was the World Value Surveys. Uh, the number of people that were surveyed for this study is 1,206. And the period of time that the people were surveyed was 2010 to 2014. Measures of association are gamma and eta, while the results will be displayed in a cross tabulation paper. The dependent variable, as shown in World Value Survey, follow public opinion on governments taxing the rich and subsidizing the poor. While the questions that were asked to the people who were surveyed was, do you support or not taxation of the rich in Sweden as an essential characteristic of democracy? The answers, uh, which will be shown also on the tables as we analyze the independent variables, follow. Does not support tax in the rich, somehow supports tax in the rich, supports tax in the rich, and strongly supports tax in the rich. Independent variables are political variable, social variable, economic variable, and the demographic variable. The conceptual theory shows the connection that the independent variables have towards the dependent variable, which is public opinion on taxation of the rich. Before I talk more in depth about my first hypothesis and the found findings that I have for this one, I want to describe the tables and how it is designed because the tables will look similar for all the other hypotheses. On the left, you see the four categories which show the four key points of describing the dependent variable of taxing the rich. This column will be the same on all the tables you'll see today because it shows the correlation that the dependent variable has towards the independent variables. The categories on top uh, here, uh, they show the independent variable and how that is categorized. This will change on every table based on the independent variable we are analyzing. The first hypothesis for this study is people with full-time employment are more likely to support taxation of the rich as an essential characteristic of democracy. My theory behind coming up with this hypothesis was that people with full-time employment earn more, therefore they're willing to uh, uh, pay more taxes to distribute wealth in their country. Uh, based on the results of this hypothesis, uh, this uh, is not supported, and that is because people with part-time employment or self-employed have a higher percentage than the people with full-time employment. As you can see here, there is a similar percentage before, uh, between the part-time employment and self-employment, which is 40%, uh, against the 39% here with the full-time employment. I want everyone to take a closer look at the 40% uh, here, which is the total overall percentage. Uh, this percentage will be similar to all the other tables because that shows the overall percentage of how much adult population in Sweden supports that tax in the rich. To put this in perspective, I compared this overall percentage to how much Americans support tax in the rich. And only 18% of Americans support this view. This percentage show a big difference of the adult how the adult population sees tax in the rich in these two countries. My second hypothesis is lower classes are more likely to support taxation of the rich as an essential characteristic of democracy. The theory behind coming up with this hypothesis was that lower classes think that the rich should pay more taxes in order to redistribute wealth in their society. This hypothesis is not very supported because there is not much difference between the two percentages, um, which is 44 and 43% uh, between lower and middle class and working class. What was interesting looking at this independent variable, social class in Sweden, is that there the upper class and the lower class are somehow non-existent. As shown in our world value survey, this percentage for these two classes was under 10%. That's why we get this interesting combination of words, which is a combination between upper 
class and lower class or middle class and lower class. Because as I stated before, the middle class is very dominant in Sweden. Hypothesis number three is that people who place their views more on the left wing are more likely to support taxation of the rich as an essential characteristic of democracy. This hypothesis is strongly supported, and it's very self-explanatory that um, the left would support this view because this view is considered to be very progressive. Uh, the left are the liberals, while the right are the conservatives. To put that in perspective, in American politics, the Democrats are considered to be the left because of their liberal views, while the Republicans are considered to be the right because of their conservative views. Well, this is number four, is that women are more likely to support taxation of the rich as an essential characteristic of democracy. The theory behind coming up with this hypothesis is that uh, men are traditionally known to be the breadwinner. Therefore, they will be less likely to support taxation of the rich because they're more self-reliant. There is an eight percentage difference between uh, women and male who support tax on the rich. That's what makes this hypothesis uh, supported. Need an analysis. In findings and analysis, we can see that uh, the political and the demog demographic independent variables have the most influence on the dependent variable, whether the adult populations uh, think that in Sweden think that the government should tax the rich and subsidize the poor. The economic variable did not have a very big impact in my study, while the social variable did influence the dependent variable at a considerable percentage. Implications. Some of the implications for this study would be that 40% is a big percentage of the population who support taxing the rich. A factor for this a big percentage would be the generous social welfare in Sweden, which does require high taxation. Another reason why Swedish people don't complain about their high taxes is that they trust their policymakers on the laws that are imposed in them. Therefore, if they are satisfied with the social benefits they receive from their government, they are, uh, are less, more likely to pay higher taxes. Thank you very much for your attention. If we have questions, I'll be happy to answer that in the end of the presentation. Thank you, Idona. Good, good job. Our uh, final presentation is by Muhajir Akbar on the topic of world's inequality taxing the top 1%. Move your head. Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to share my presentation with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mujahid Agbar, and I'm from Palestine. My major is financial economics, business, and marketing. And I've traveled so far to over 25 countries, and I'm happy today to share some of my thoughts with you. So, as we can see here, there's a big wealth gap between the top 1% and other people who make under $10,000. We can see here that there's a lot of adults, almost 3.5 billion adults, who make uh, below $10,000. And then there's almost 1% or less than 1% who make more than 1 million. I think this is... Um, pretty bad. It's very catastrophic to see how um, the wealth is very different. There's almost half of the wealth is going for, for very few people. And um, the, the, the wealth is usually measured by um, the real estate or how much housing there is available, minus their debt. So it's uh, usually the assets that people own. Uh, at least this is what the scale that was used for the SUS Global Wealth Report. Um, and usually to be in the 1%, you have to make uh, $422,000 per year, uh, yeah, per year in the US. So here are some facts, because I feel like I wanted to focus more about the world, but most of our audience is from the US, so might as well give some facts from the US. So one out of seven Americans live be below poverty line, and that's estimated to be 46.2 million people. And one in six Americans have no health insurance, approximately 50 million people. That's a lot of people that do not have access to health care. And as we know, hospitals are crazy expensive in the US. Um, there's of 17 Americans, at least one will earn less than the minimum wage. 
and 14.5% of American households are defined as food insecure. Um, it's also, there's a really high percentage of 78% uh, of workers in the US live paycheck to paycheck. So uh, we can see in the pandemic, a lot of people were affected by, um, you know, losing their jobs and that makes it so difficult for them. And I think when we look into the situation where people really need the stimulus check, that $1,400 or whatever is gonna influence their life, we know there's a big problem over there. Um, I think it's also vital to understand how wealth is created for the most part. Um, for example, the 1% tend to have their wealth diversified in multiple things, including bonds, stocks, housing, versus um, usually the middle class own most of their wealth through their housing. The poorer class is, you know, like maybe a car or something. Um, so it's vital to understand how this stuff influence the lifestyle. I'll be talking more about um, how the financial crash influenced people. Um, differently but so i think it's very interesting what idona said earlier about the there's 18 percent of americans that who um vote for the idea of um taxing i think i i wanted to present this argument so yeah i mean there's um there's a an eric uh, wilkinson who is basically Part of the one percent is a trader in wall street and he said like why should these people be penalized they're the headway in the society they should pay their fair, fair taxes but they shouldn't be taxed more they deserve their money you know if you work hard for it you should make it and i think this is the delusion that a lot of americans and a lot of people in the world have that if you work hard enough in life you should be able to get whatever you want but you can't deny the fact that some people start a lot earlier than others. It takes money to make money in economics. We say that the more money you have, the more leverage you make and the, more, the easiest for you to make money. And we can see that a lot of, um, you know, the rich, the top 1% is, you know, concentrated in the US and it makes, makes sense because the rules here are, makes it very easy for the rich to be here and it makes it very easy to avoid taxes in a way. And I'll be talking more about this um, in a bit, but I think it's just very vital to understand that people who are born with a golden spoon in their mouth have higher likelihood of having a better lifestyle than those who are born in poverty traps that are born that they have to help their families and I think, yes, they, the rich deserve their money to an extent, but you should also understand that it's influencing someone else. So wealth taxes have a bit, I have a bit of problem with it because for Wall Street, they usually get tax cuts. So they get 15% tax taxes usually. And the average people, for example, who earn between 100K to 200K get 20%, 25% taxes. Meanwhile, the richest 400 uh, people, they get paid, they, they pay 23% in taxes. And I think there's a bit of difference here. We're categorizing people and this is dangerous because again it's like sustaining power for a certain class in a way um also one one note um from my supervisor that um inspired me with, with the wealth tax um that we usually pay for assuming our car or houses like cyclical tax every month or every like quarter period and that's because you have an asset for example if you own a house you usually have to pay a wealth tax for it every month or so. Meanwhile, on your stock portfolio, you don't pay for that. You usually pay for the dividends, which is not a lot. I mean, it depends on how much you own, obviously, but it's comparing with the, the, the taxes you pay for the housing, I think it's drastically different. And you don't really consider the appreciation cost that you know your, your stocks can value a lot at some points and you don't, get taxed for the value of the stock. And this is how the rich again gets to be richer. Um, this is how, for example, um, you know, most most of the rich, they buy and hold, they like buy a stock and they hold it for life. And it just the value of it keeps, keeps accumulating, accumulating, you're making more money. Meanwhile, the poor just have housing or the middle class even. And that makes it difficult for them because they constantly have to feed in the system of paying taxes um if you talk about the market crash in uh, 2008 for example um 
when housing crashed, a lot of people lost their their money. The rich obviously lost a lot, but what is a lot? You were thinking about relatively again, how much wealth you have and how diversified are your investments. So why, um, why taxes can be a good incentive um, to like make the rich spend on the 99%. I think it's very important to understand that um, when top marginal taxes were created and they were high, you know, executives and CEOs were less likely to like be bargaining aggressively. They are modest with their ag aggression. They were more likely to pay more for their employees. Um, meanwhile, when the taxes started to drop, the, the CEOs and the employ employers started arguing more aggressively. And this talks a bit about the human ego in a way, at least for me, that the, there's this idea that the more we have, the more we want. And it's just greed. It feeds your, your greed that you want to own as much as possible. Maybe a lot of you don't believe me, and I'll, I'll be doing a, a small example in the, in the fund that from a company that we all use, but I think it's vital to understand that, you know, a lot of the wealth is created uh, on, on the shoulders of the 99%, and which is the middle and the poor class, and we're in this together. We, we have seen that productivity has doubled in the last few years. But still, the the salaries and the wages has not really increased much. And I think it's, again, trying to choose efficiency with the employees versus um, not rewarding them for their efforts. So Amazon is a good example. We all use Amazon. I, I, I doubt you know, none, none of the people here has not used it. Um, and, and that's OK. But I think it's, uh, it's vital to understand what companies you're buying into and what type of things you're getting. Um, so Amazon paid zero uh, dollars in federal tax in the last 20 years. And I think it's, it's just how the business model makes it so easy for them to, to do that. And they actually even made money through uh, tax refunds and offsetting carbon and all that. So I think that's very interesting how the business model is made. Um, Amazon, as we know, is one of the most profitable companies. There's a lot of Fortune 500 who didn't pay any taxes to. I think it's vital to understand how this theory of the less tax you pay, the more um, the more aggressive slash greedy you'd be. There's actually some cases that um, um, you know Amazon was stealing tips. Amazon was not rewarding their um, their employees. They're overworking them. Some people just fall down while working. And there's this recent case um, actually all over the world, not just in Europe, uh, not just in the UK, where Amazon workers are urinating in plastic bottles and defecating in like plastic bags. I think it's a terrible situation that we don't even understand. We just get our little box in of Amazon. We're like, wow, yeah, I'm like happy now because I'm consuming more and, and feeding in this capitalist system. I think it's just vital to realize that you're living in a situation where, I mean, some people had to be you know, some people had to suffer in order for you to receive what you're receiving. And I think it's vital to re realize the privilege. Um, one thing that really scares me from Amazon is the, the data collection because they have the power to estimate how much, um, you know, businesses are making and which industries are selling more, which industries are selling less. And this makes them able to create um, newer production for example let's say batteries were a big uh, purchase on amazon so amazon can see that small businesses are making a lot of money in batteries so they start making their amazon basic and once you order it through uh, alexa then you just get their products and this just creates a monopoly in a way that these people are making so much money from other potential small businesses and this is why i think amazon can be scary so i think as you know, I'm, as some of you know, maybe, um, I'm from Palestine, and I think it's a very terrible situation over there. Um, we're colonized by Israel, and I think we can see from the table here that the lifestyle is just completely, you can tell the discrimination and inequality in there. Um, I think it's vital to realize that one's privilege is, is another person's misery. And for you to get whatever resources you want in life, sometimes you have to have someone else make it. If you wanted coffee, some farmer had to 
form it, other people had to ship it, you know, some child labor could be part of it if, if you're buying a chocolate, for example. And I think this is why I'm asking people to be more conscious of the way they're mm -hmm. buying things and the way they're consuming things too. Um, I think for me, this represents the human nature and the, the human ego versus cooperation because we tend to be both. We tend to want to help one another and we tend to want to be better than others, be other people. Um, and I think it's vital to realize that we're all in this together. There's a story back home that we say um, about the three bulls and there's a black bull who's the strongest bull. And then basically there's a lion and the lion wants to eat the three bulls. So he convinced the three brother bulls, two of the, of the brother bulls to kill the black bull. And then he convinced one of the brother bulls to kill the other bull. So one bull is left. And then when the lion comes to eat him, he says, I died when the black bull died. So it's it's about the idea that, okay, yeah, I'm not in, in a very bad position now. Like, I'll be okay. You know, I, I'm not suffering. I'm, I'm still in a privileged position, but it's it's not okay for you to wait until, you know, the system breaks down on you or, you know, the system fails you and you're left alone. I think the more cooperative humans are, the more we can, we can do stuff. And you can tell from like different world systems that those who cooperate tend to be more successful and the more hierarchy we have, the more challenging of a lifestyle we could have, or, you know, almost, almost possibly impossible to just live in it. Um, I really like this idea of, um, 19 or 1984 by George Orwell that power is not a means it's an end so a lot of us think that um, money is just the idea of being able to like you know buy stuff and just luxury and things but I think it's also vital to realize that money and uh, and assets is also just part of the game it's 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 power it's being able to dictate and control people's thoughts in a way and it's uh it's scary, you know, it can be very scary how you can, for example, with Amazon, you can predict pe people's behavior and people purchase p patterns. And um, I just think that the world could be a very dark place if we don't act. And this is why I feel I I'd like to hold people responsible for the actions. We tend to live in a world where we feel like there's less resources for everyone, but we're literally, there's enough resources for everyone on, in this world and we can all live in peace together. We all have the space to create and coexist. So I think some suggestions from my side would be um, understanding the difference between equality and equity. Uh, we don't all need the same resources. We tend to require different things. And I think it's vital to realize that meeting these different demands is a good way to start. You know, some countries might need, for example, um, help with climate change, which I'll be talking about later today. I'd love to have you guys there. But um, different companies have different needs, different company, different, different countries have um, different infrastructure and thus it can be different for everyone. So taxing is a good way, at least from my thoughts and my conclusion from my research, to distribute wealth between people. It's also a good way, as we mentioned earlier, the more taxes you have in the, in the system, the less aggressive employers would be. And I think it's uh, one way to reduce um, inequality. Taxes can be reinvested into education, can, taxes can be invested in multiple parts of the infrastructure and society. And I think, again, like you don't, the 1% doesn't need all this money to start with. You can, you can help other people who are making less than $10,000 and it even gets worse in certain countries because obviously not everyone lives in the standards of developed countries. Also ending monopolies is very vital and this is why I talked about Amazon a bit because um, I feel like it's becoming one or it's been one probably. So it's it's vital that you support local businesses and you know take care of the, the smaller um, startups because this is one way to ensure um, equality between people, or at least ensuring that this, um, these businesses are able to thrive. Um, empathy is another thing because um, I think we need to take care of one another. We need to push for helping each other. Think less of, of uh, a system of consuming and more about helping one another, you know, just giving for one another and support one another because I feel like in the end of the day we're all humans and we all deserve to live a happy life it's not a pie that if I have more you'll have less there's enough resources for everyone I just think that 
we are fed in the system to take and consume things that we don't necessarily need for the most part. And this is why you need to educate yourself. Education is vital and it's a, a great skill for you to have in this um, modern world because you have to know what type of things you're getting into and uh, what type of things you're purchasing. Just just be aware of, of the different aspects of how things work. And yeah, I think uh, this is my presentation pretty much. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, thank you so much. I like that slide. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good concluding slide. Thank you for your presentation. I found it interesting how all three seem to have some common elements. Uh, I said you talked about how uh, your topic segues from the Swedish, the topic on Sweden. You talked about uh, redistribution, which is what Carolyn talked about. And we have uh, a lot of good questions already lined up in the chat. And I'm going to try to moderate these questions uh, as we go. Uh, please continue to uh, add to those questions. But the uh, I'm going to also I'm going to give priority to questions from students. So students, go ahead and get your questions in there. First one comes for Carolyn from uh, this is from Daniel's iPhone. Okay, so Daniel asks, did COVID have a positive or negative result in trust in government from the Democratic Party or from the Republican Party? Um, so this kind this question kind of um, goes beyond the scope of my research a little bit, but I think that we'll be able to see a little bit more of it in the next World Value Survey um, research that will start in 2021 and extend until 2024. I'm pretty sure it's every four years. Um, so we'll be able to see a little bit more after that survey data comes out. But I think that um, just like in my like my personal opinion there for the positive and negative results like we can see even with the vaccines how a lot of people in the republican party do not trust the vaccine that it comes from the government it was made too fast all these other things so i think that we can kind of see elements of confidence in government with every with the policies that occurred because of covid but um like i said it's a little bit beyond the scope of my research okay good thank you i'm going to make a clarification i did have a question about how we're going to do questions and uh, our plan is to do all the questions through the chat we will not uh, have a conversation where the audience unmutes so if you have questions please put them into the chat uh, okay Idona we have one from uh, I think this is Jafrizi I hope I pronounced that correctly probably did Idona <clears throat> why do you think in Sweden gender perspectives differ with taxation policies and do you think it, it's an optimal solution for other nations, for instance, the EU? It's interesting finding actually to see a difference between women and men in Sweden because they are uh, very equal uh, when it comes to that. Women do have a lot of similar opportunities uh, than men do in Sweden. And, the percentage there was just uh, was slightly higher if the woman uh, support taxation bridge more. And that's probably uh, going back to my theory that uh, of coming up with that hypothesis is that the men are the breadwinner and probably because they work more, they don't want to pay more taxes. While the women who stay at home more with the children, they don't mind extra benefits uh, or extra uh, money from the government if they tax the rich more. Um, and um, the other part of the question, if I think that uh, this is an optimal solution for other nations, as, as I'm understanding that question is that, can Sweden be an example for the other nations in EU especially? Uh, Sweden is known to tax uh, their population higher than all the other EU countries, but uh, in general, um, European countries kind of function similarly when it comes to being a social democratic uh, government, which uh, tax the population higher than probably the government in the United States does. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Idona. Mahajad, uh, we have one for you here from uh, Dr. Cronin. Uh, I'm curious if you had 
to pick between the following, which you would argue is more effective to address issues raised in your presentation? One, increasing wealth taxes, or two, advocating responsible consumerism? Yeah, I think this is a very good question, actually. Um, I think it's very dependent of where are you and where do you live, because it's all about education, how much aware of the system generally you are, how much do you know about, um, again, like what you're consuming and what you're not consuming. I feel like generally speaking, we have a different levels of knowledge in, 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 in the country usually or in, in, in every country. And this is why I feel like achieving um, responsible consumerism might be difficult. Um, but I think the, the tax is more like of a generic system that you could just simply apply it and it would um, it would help everyone in a way. So I would probably, if, if I get to choose to educate everyone and, you know, make them more powerful in a way to with, with, with choosing the right destiny, I would definitely choose with the idea of responsible uh, consum consumerism. But I think this one might be difficult with our access of education and the you know, the whole idea of income inequality goes hand in hand with what type of resources you get access to to start with. So I feel like maybe starting with the taxes can alleviate poverty in a way and help people to learn more about the thing. And it, it goes both ways. I don't think you can really separate them, but I would I would say it's a situational based on where you live. Um. Muhajad, I'm glad that you got to answer that question. I don't think I'd want to have to pick between those two. Good, good job. Okay, Carolyn, back to you. We have a question from Dr. Knudsen. Do you think confidence in government is too abstract? Do you think asking Americans more specific or concrete questions would result in different results? For example, do you support the expansion of Social Security and Medicare or expansion in the Affordable Care Act? So yeah, so one of the problems that I came across when doing my research present, when doing my research was that confidence in government is a really abstract topic. And we were limited to the World Value Survey and their wording for, such, um, for our variables. Um, I, so kind of going on, like I saw Dr. Cronin ask a question, like how I would specify it and like, um, the, one of the problems with those two examples, you export the, the expansion of Social Security and Medicare, the expansion of the Affordable Care Act, is that when you word questions in such a way, a lot of the times it already like it, it dictates how people will answer. Like if you're a Republican and you see the Affordable Care Act, you know that's Obamacare, like, oh no, that's the other team. No, I don't approve of that. Even though like, so it's, it's all about wording, like being very picky with the wording. Um, I personally, would have loved to test kind of like institutions like do you have trust in this particular institution congress um maybe like maybe even differentiating between the senate and the house of representatives um or even some, i was um particularly interested in local government versus national government because that kind of takes away what dr cronin asked in his question earlier about the when we like my team is in power kind of local politics is a little bit more nonpartisan. Um, so that's what I was interested in. We were just kind of limited through the World Value Survey and what information and survey data there. Okay, thank you. Yudona, this question comes from Dr. Trapp. Do you think because the Swedish are a homogenous society that this also factors into support for high taxation? Um, that's a very common question when it comes to this topic. and. Yes, uh, if we compare the United States to Sweden, Sweden is very homogeneous, but I don't think we should uh, just try to pick on that point because in the past 30 years, Sweden has had uh, immigration, a lot of uh, people from Middle East, also the Balkans have uh, migrated to this country. So I don't think that really puts the stability of the government into question because uh, they just, uh, and this I think relates to another question that was asked, um, later on, uh, the government is just very effective and tax courage uh, and probably people would want to pay more taxes just because this is being distributed to everyone, but no, they, uh, 
like their social benefits and they trust their government. That's why they don't mind paying taxes. But the homogeneity, of course, comes into question here, but I don't think we should kind of pinpoint on that to uh, uh, just see the effectiveness of how taxation works in Sweden. Okay, <clears throat> okay, thank you. Muhajed, this comes from uh, Sergio Alva. This is a tough one. Are you ready? What is your opinion on the tax capitalization effect that would likely present itself should heavier taxes fall on those most wealthy? Uh, tax wealth equals, if you tax wealth, that equals lower asset value, which equals less tax revenue as investors look elsewhere. I think that's a great question. And I think this will refer actually to my next presentation about climate change and um, inequalities in the world um, later today, if you're interested to learn more about that. Um, but I think, yes, like this is going to influence how investors and where investors will be. But it's also important to understand that you know, investors would always seek a way to find, you know, the least path of resistance in a way, the, the best way to accumulate money. And obviously, this is why we saw in the graph that there was a lot of 1% concentrated in the US, because obviously, these laws are allowing them to do that. Um, thinking globally more than just one country specific, if we are able to globally um, increase taxes in a way, then I mean, obviously, some countries are doing a better job into it, especially in Europe, I'd say. The, the, the difference between the gaps is, uh, is not as, as drastic as in the US. So yes, investors will, will look to go somewhere else. But then by the time you already actually help to reduce the, the gap between one another. And also, I think it's important to understand that a lot of this money that the 1% have is not even reported. A lot of it is, is just hidden in places or in islands. And I think I've, I've read an article the other day that it's just a lot of these assets are not even reported to the IRS. So I feel like investors are already seeking to like hide their money somewhere else. So I might as well, you know, just consider a global idea of taxing the 1% everywhere. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to do it, but this is something that um, like the World Bank and like bigger institutions have to consider. Okay, thank you. Carolyn, this question comes from uh, Reggie Bohannon. Do you think that trust in government will have an additional effect on lower voter turnout or higher voter turnout? Oh, that, Reggie, this one's kind of tricky. Um, so I think that it kind of has like the opposite effect that I think that voter turnout affects confidence in government, not like the other way around, even though like, I guess you could kind of, it's one of those variables that you could kind of see it either way. Um, but with higher voter turnout, obviously there's more voices being representative, rep represented, in uh, represented in your vote. And therefore I believe that it will lead to um, a, like higher trust in government because if there's more voices represented, then of course you're gonna trust the people that you vote in. And I think that low voter turnout does have a large effect on why we um, people are so distrustful of government. But then at the same time, like I can see it the opposite way, how if like higher voter turnouts, like can lead to more, I mean, how higher confidence in government can lead to higher voter turnout because people are more excited about elections and politics and the government. So I could really see it either way, but I do think that they, there is some relationship between the two. Okay, thank you. Well, I had one here and I lost it, sorry. Okay, here it is, Donna. This is also from Reggie. Uh, do you think that the welfare state in Sweden has favorable numbers because they see their tax dollars being put to work? Definitely. Um, the efficiency of the government, as, as I stated in the other question, is very vital in, uh, in Sweden. What I would also point out is that um, there the checks and balances are very well controlled in, in a way because when the legislative make uh, rules, the administrative workers just get to work. And even though they uh, tax 
uh, more in general. They don't just tax the rich more, they tax in general. In Sweden, uh, they are just very efficient in their social benefits, healthcare, education, uh, uh, job employment benefits, and all of that. So definitely, because they do see all those benefits coming from government, they are willing to contribute more to their society and to the government by taxing. Okay, thank you. Now this is going to Carolyn from Dr. Trapp. Do you think how older Americans have been socialized accounts for their support of the government while younger Americans grew up in a society that is more polarized and thus are constantly questioning the policies of government, especially with the rise of social media? So I think definitely, um, especially with the rise of social media, I think we see a lot more like polarization with younger Americans, like younger, like my generation, like we easily can get on Instagram and snap a photo, give our arguments, talk about politics, um, where it's much harder to kind of look someone in the face and talk about politics than it is to post a Snapchat story or to send a text message. Um, so I do think that that does have a lot to do with the polarization and confidence in government because social media like you're seeing bad news constantly when um the older generation it was harder for you to get news like um that things are going wrong but with the rise of social media like obviously like, even we saw now with the pandemic breaking out like we were getting live action news at the things that, that were happening like um, during the summer when the protests were going on we were getting live actions we're seeing everything go down and i think that that does have um, a really large effect on our popul on like on the younger Americans and their confidence in government. Okay, thank you. I did have one here for Edona from Dr. Cronin. Yes, he says he asks, uh, which way do you lean? What do you is that the right one? Yeah, which way do you lean? What do you find in Sweden can be generalized for other nations? Or are these findings specific only to Sweden? My findings are specific to Sweden. Nevertheless, I think that uh, they can be used or other nations can use uh, the taxation system in Sweden for their own uh, governments and their own countries uh, because it is a very balanced system in my opinion. Uh, they are considered, their tax system is considered to be very progressive um, when it comes to like uh, taxing the people based on their income. Uh, but what is interesting for Sweden is that they also use the back tax a lot. Uh, and I've talked a lot about that in my literature review. Um, the back tax is considered to be a regressive tax or it's considered to be a hidden tax. But the way it is balanced in Sweden, still, even though they use that at higher percentage, they are still considered to be. Uh, very progressive on their taxation system. Um, so, yeah, I think that other countries can use Sweden as an example to balance their tax uh, system in order to redistribute wealth and have um, uh, not a very big gap between the uh, upper class and the lower class. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mujahid, we have one for you from uh, Jacob. He asks, do you think that an increase in taxes for the 1% would lead to a decrease of business as one of the biggest incentives will be heavily taxed? Um, that's an interesting question. I think it's actually gonna work the opposite way, at least the way that I see it is, because the, the taxing is not gonna be like everyone is gonna be taxed equally is going to be more at least the way that i understand is going to be more based on brackets tax brackets and tax systems so if you fall if you make this amount of income you have to be taxed this percentage and it's in a way i feel like that could be an incentive for smaller businesses to start you know you can encourage them with that and you can actually use the taxes from the bigger corporations to reinvest in creating a climate that is um, efficient and that is thriving for smaller businesses. So I don't think it's actually a bad incentive. And also I think it's the whole idea of the taxing is not making people's life difficult. It's making the poor and the middle class able to thrive and make, you know, good living for them. So my intention is not 
gonna be like you know you can't create a small business and you can't become a big corporation actually i'm trying to support these smaller businesses to grow bigger and i think this is a misconsumption of mis mis misunderstanding of uh, of this whole tax situation that i'm um, i'm addressing thank you okay we have a question from uh, dr o'neill who says this is a historian asking a historical question for Carolyn. Since the 14th Amendment and the Great Depression in particular, one of the federal government's jobs has been to protect people, especially minorities, from impositions by local governments or later by other people. Does that change your notion of how and why confidence works? What if confidence in government is just a way to think through who people think deserves protection? I've read that like at least 10 times and I am trying to think of an answer. So it definitely did make me think um, and I don't have a good answer for you off the top of my head, but I will, like, I'm going to look into that and I'm going to find an answer. It just won't, might not be right now, but that did make me think. So thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a great answer. I need to remember that answer in the future. <laughs> so let me ask, ask the panelists if you can help me. If I, oh, I do see a new question here uh, and actually a couple of new ones. I'll, we'll go to uh, Dr. Knutson again for Muhajid. Uh, any proposed wealth tax may hit estates with $50 million and above and be roughly 2%. The ultra wealthy typically don't manage their money but hire hedge funds or other groups to manage this wealth. For this, they typically pay upwards of 10% fee each year. Does a wealth tax seem quite small then? I, uh, I definitely think it's very small. I think it's a very accurate and smart question. Um, Dr. Konotsin is also one of my uh, supervisor. Um, so I think that's a very accurate way of directing uh, an idea, but I definitely think that the taxes are, um, you know, are very small. There's a lot of money that we're paying for other people. Obviously, from Professor Wayland perspective, if someone is willing to make me more money on my money, then I'll definitely pay it. From paying um, and one hundred thousand dollars on my money to make um, one million, then I will definitely take the deal. Um, so I think this is why there's like a percentage fee to obviously um, pay for people to manage their funds. Um, and this is one way to increase probably their their wealth, and this is why they're working so well with it. Um, but also, we're thinking again selfishly at this stage that you know these people are just concentrating on making more money for themselves, and I think the taxes is, is more about the public, and this is why we as the people should unite together and think about ways of <clears throat> ways of um, you know. In ensuring equality among everyone, I think definitely two percent is a very low um, percentage. Okay, I think this will be the last question. It's also going to you, uh, Rajid. Uh, I think this question has probably been asked in, in several different ways. So we'll give you one more opportunity to answer this question. Uh, this one comes from Michael uh, Mellons. If you tax the successful, then why would anyone work hard to be successful? Well, this is a very interesting dilemma. And as I said, I'm not trying to hinder people's growth. I think, yes, that's the problem for me when I think about it. Like, okay, yeah, I could be a good CEO too in life, right? I could make a lot of money, hopefully. But then are you really comparing a person who has trillions and billions and millions of, of dollars in their bank account. They already have portfolio stock and everything managed for themselves, born with a golden spoon in their mouth with you or, I mean, they, they, they just the public that we can't even envision what the 1% is making. That if I work hard and get my 7.25 minimum wage, 
that I'll be one day a billionaire. I mean, I think it's it's probably a very low probability. And I think it's the whole idea of it is understanding that we're trying to make a system that make everyone make obviously enough to thrive and grow and buy whatever they want but it it achieves to a limit where you can't really spend that money even if you spend if you buy a lamborghini every day type of thing that you know you can't just spend it there's some some like studies where like you know like i think it's amazon making nine hundred thousand dollars per minute or something like that i think it's crazy that when you think about it some people are making uh, their net worth is less than ten thousand dollars you're talking about you know you can buy a lot of people if you want to consider the system as a capital and how much you're worth so again it's my idea is ensuring that people are making enough to thrive and grow and obviously the more you work for it the the better and this system actually enables actual like real, I would say like capitalism in terms of that there's equal opportunities for everyone rather than how much capital you have and how much capital you could make and how much leverage you use to make wealth. Okay, good, thank you. I want to thank uh, all the questioners. Those were uh, really good questions. I think you uh, did uh, test the presenters who also did well. And I, and I want to thank the light man for turning the lights back on. Uh, I want to thank uh, our three presenters for all the work that they uh, that they did uh, preparing for uh, these presentations today, and also for their performance. I think uh, I think they did I think they did just fine. And I again want to thank the audience for joining us uh, for this session of the symposium. And I want to just remind you that the symposium continues uh, this afternoon check the schedule uh, for uh, a presentation you may want to view in the afternoon session. And there are also research posters uh, displayed in the, in, the area, in the quad area. And uh, this is another way to observe research by Methodist University students. Uh, this research symposium is a great opportunity to see what uh, other students are doing in their research. So thanks, thanks all again. Uh, this concludes our session, and I'm going to end the meeting for everyone. Thank you.